Hello and welcome to Clock Spinning, the podcast of Magic's history as told card by card through Cube. I'm Austin and with me as always is Connor. How are you today, Connor? I'm doing pretty good. I've been uh, been burning this pumpkin spice candle, like one of those crackly candles a lot. And <laughs> Isn't it a little me... early for that? No, it's, it's September now. You know, it's helping me get into, it never really becomes fall here in LA. It just kind of gets a little bit colder, so I need to... You know, I need to sort of create autumn for myself. Huh. Have you considered cranking up the AC in your house so it, it feels colder than it is? It it does feel pretty cold right now, actually, in the house, so I should probably turn it off. Huh. We've had like two power outages in the past two days, which I wonder, you know, if it's related to heat. Are they, or, or it could be caused by your candle. You, th- you think that's knocking out the power? Yeah, I think I think you are, you're knocking out the power to... West LA. I think I better write a letter to the power company. <laughs> it doesn't seem out of uh, out of belief for PGE, right? No. Okay. All right. That's our LA talk done. Today, we have a very special episode for all of you. Um, this was an episode inspired by the Champions of Kami- Kamigawa Red episode, where we noticed that there is a strange preponderance of four mana red 1-1 one, one creatures in Champions of Kamigawa. I believe there are three. Uh, and that inspired us. And we said, how many of these are there total? And it turns out there are 24 four mana red one ones in magic. And then as we dug into them, many of them come with some pretty interesting stories. Like, for example, one of these created the first player rebellion in the history of magic, which, of course, is a regular feature today. One of these cards uh, was part of a competitive standard deck. One of these is a uh, non a legend, but isn't a legend. Um, so lots of kind of fun, interesting, quirky cards. And we thought, you know, it would be fun to just talk about 24 four mana red one ones. Yep. I, I think actually we um, we decided sort of tentatively to do this episode after, like right after that Kamigawa red episode. And we, we were just looking at these cards and how weird they are and how much fun some of them are and thinking it would be kind of cool to do an episode on this. So here we are. Yeah, we figured we're already talking about, you know, bad cards. So we might as well lean into it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, find find some more bad cards to to throw at you guys. Yep, uh, we're not doing our usual impab rating scale because uh, we don't intend to build a four mana one one cube as uh, interesting an experiment as that could be. So instead, we are going to rate these just for fun. We're going to rate them on the standard kind of YouTuber S to F scale, which if you're not familiar with it, S is like super special, top grade, ultimate, amazing cards. Um, I think this comes from fighting games or something like that. Does that sound right? I guess so. Sure. So S is the best. Then it's kind of like an American uh, letter grade system. A, B, C, D, E, interestingly, and F. So from S to F, if you didn't memorize all that, don't worry about it too much. Just know S is special. And then from there on, we go through the alphabet. And the further on you get, the worse the card is. Yeah, I I would say uh, F is probably going to be the most important letter for this episode. (laughs) They're not not all Fs. Some of them are (laughs) non-Fs. All right. Should we get into them? Yeah, let's get into it. I'm excited. Okay, well, we spoke about the Champions of Kamigawa inspiration for this episode. And so uh, appropriately enough, our very first card here is a Champions of Kamigawa card. We have Aki Lava Runner, which is a flip card that flips into Tok Tok Volcano Born. So Aki Lava Runner is three and an R for a 1-1 Goblin Warrior with haste. And when he deals damage to your opponent, flip it. Talk Talk, the flip side, is a legendary Goblin Shaman with protection from red. He's a 2-2. And if a red source would deal damage to a player, it deals that much damage plus one instead. Okay, that was a lot. So to briefly recap, four mana, hasty 1-1, one, one, flips into a 2-2 two, two with pro red that uh, amps up all red damage by one. Whew. Okay. Um, this is a fun, funky card, I think, to start with. It sees a little teeny bit of fringe play in EDH, uh, primarily in Subira Tulzidi Caravaner, uh, which is a, a difficult name to say, but essentially she's a one, a two power or less tribal commander. And of course, um, Aki Lava Runner uh, is two power or less on both of his sides. So he's got some cute interactions uh, with Subira, who loves to help your two power or less creatures connect with your opponent, which is exactly what Aki Lava Runner wants to do. So that's pretty cute. Apart from that, he doesn't seem to see much play anywhere in any format. And playability wise, I think this guy's 
pretty close to the bottom of the barrel, even by four mana one, one standards, uh, primarily because he needs to connect, uh, and he's not equipped by nature to connect with your opponent, which is, uh, which is unfortunate. That said, he does have some kind of fun things going for him. Uh, he's got a pretty unique effect on the backside. Uh, I like that he poses kind of a cool deck construction puzzle. Um, and then he's got some pretty funny art. If you're not familiar with the Kamigawa, uh, goblins, go look them up. They're wacky. Um, they're kind of like turtle kappa creatures. Um, and I think this art's pretty fun, especially the unflipped side. Uh, so I, I landed at a B rating for Aki Lava Runner. W- what about you, Connor? Uh, so this will be a theme. I landed uh, at F. And I, oh, I'm looking back no. at the comments. I, I think I, I must have downgraded him at some point without even like consciously thinking about it because in my comments, I said that I think we're starting off near the bottom of the tier list, not quite at the bottom, but pretty close. And then I gave him an F. I don't know about F Connor. I mean, I think he's pretty terrible, but so we decided to grade on a curve a little bit here, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't be able to award any S's or A's or probably even B's. And I feel like grading on a curve, like if you take into account how interesting he is and how like the effect, I I feel like this is certainly above an F. This is, this has got to be like at least a, a E or a D in your mind, surely. Yeah, maybe, maybe a D for me I, I i could i could bump him up to a d since apparently that's what i was thinking earlier i mean he is he is a pretty interesting card but uh, honestly most of the cards we're talking about today are pretty interesting not good not strong but fun to think about so he he definitely qualifies there and i think when we were doing the kamigawa red uh set review we sort of talked about talk talks uh during the talk 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 we talked about his potential <laughs> for, Ooh. Ooh. Uh, you know, helping out some of the shamans and, and things in Kamigawa that ping for a little bit of damage, sort of a pyromancer type effect. And I, I think that I, I liked Talk Talk a little bit more in that context, but maybe here when he's not surrounded by these pinging shamans, I just can't feel the love as much. Well, so I think part of the reason I, I liked him is because he, he does pose some interesting deck construction challenges like he he asks you how are you going to get through um and deal damage and i don't think that's particularly good like if this guy was three mana i think this would actually be pretty interesting little card but at four it's just a little too expensive but i like that he at least sort of as soon as i read him i immediately start thinking about how to build a deck around him and that's something you can't say for too many cards on this list or you know even a lot of cards in the history of magic you know i feel like this guy instantly makes you at least puzzle through how you might make him work yeah, I think that's that's definitely true. And, you know, at, he is a rare, a, a surprising number of cards on this list are rare. Uh, and I feel like this is the <laughs> yeah, kind I of think the majority are rare, which is pretty weird. Yeah. Kind, or at least a, a plurality. little bit baffling. And he has he has the kind of effect that I, you know, like to see on a rare card. It's not high power, but it's it's weird and it's it's interesting. It's as you say, it. it It makes you think what you could do with this in a deck, what kind of deck you might be able to build around something like this. So, yeah, I mean, I, I like him, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick with D here. He's just not good. He just, you can't get to talk, talk D for Delta. Let me think about that. Uh, I don't know. I think my B is high, but I, I feel like this guy's still sort of in the near the top half for me. Um, like what about a C that's like just above the midpoint. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See? All right. Yeah, All right. Let's fine. let's I'd, move on before you change your mind. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually just below the midpoint, so I I can live with it. Well, I don't uh I feel like S almost doesn't count as the midpoint. You know what I mean? It's like there's oh, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then S is like the special shiny grade. Hmm. Okay. I'll th- okay. I'll think about that. Yeah, you think about that and take us on to our next uh next Aki. <laughs> okay, our next Aki, also from Champions of Kamigawa, of course, is Aki Underminer. 3R for a 1-1 Goblin Rogue Shaman. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, that player sacrifices a permanent. For me, there's there's really only one redeeming quality to this guy, which is his creature type, Goblin Rogue Shaman. Uh, power-wise, he's just obviously awful. He doesn't even have the haste that Aki Lava Runner comes with, um, so he's very unlikely to get a chance to connect with your opponent's face. Uh, even if he does connect with your opponent's face, uh, he doesn't let you destroy a permanent of your choice or a creature of your choice. He lets your opponent sacrifice one so they can choose anything to get rid of. They can get rid of a land, 
that they're not really using. They can get rid of a 1-1 a one, one creature token. There's just almost almost no upside to this card. It'd be kind of cool if he had you say choose land or non-land and then they sack a permanent of the chosen type. Just something that gives you a little bit more to play towards. Yeah, and something uh, like, unlike Aki Lava Runner, there's there just isn't much that's interesting about this guy, right? Like he, if if he connects, he deals one damage, and then uh, you get an effect that you know it's 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 impossible to predict what impact that's going to have uh, in until you're in the game, and the impact that it has is probably very little. Yeah, that uh, that checks out. I think you're right. There's really, I think there's one and a half interesting things about this card. I think the the creature type, Goblin Rogue Shaman, is uh, marginally interesting, and then I think the art is also kind of marginally interesting. I, I I don't know. I like it. I like uh, his kind of goofy, mischievous, but also a little bit dopey expression. Um, I like the like magics that are happening all over here, and the way he seems to have taken his magical power from this evil totem. So I, I like this artistically. I, I kind of I like the style of this. I like this artist's style, Thomas Baxa. Um but I, I think we may have mentioned this in the Kamigawa episode too, that the art doesn't actually make sense for what mm-hmm. this guy's supposedly doing, right? Like he's he has some sort of flaming torch and there's what looks like a burning totem behind him. But he's supposed to be an underminer, right? Yeah, he doesn't look like he's really undermining anything. I, I'll grant yeah, you. Yeah, I don't think he's underground. He does look like a 1-1 with no other abilities, though. <laughs> that is pretty <laughs> accurate. Look, yeah, like that is true. Much else. Yeah, so uh, what's what's your rating on this card? Uh, this is a definite F for me. Yeah, it's also an F for me. No good. I will say this sees marginal play in Subira, like uh, Aki Lava Runner. Both these uh, cards see some play in her as a decent-ish thing to connect with your opponent. Um, he appears in 329 decks, which ain't much, but honestly, it's a lot more than many of the cards that are coming up. Yeah, that really surprises me. Yeah, me too. Uh, all right, I'm 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 happy to call this an F. All right. Oh, and incidentally, before we go to the next card, if you're following along at home in the show notes, there will be a link to view all of these cards on Scryfall. So if you want to follow along, you can. Next up then, we've got Aladdin 2RR for a 1-1 creature human rogue. 1 RR tap, gain control of target artifact as long as you control Aladdin. Um, So I think the first thing to mention about Aladdin is if you listen closely, his type line does not contain the word legendary. <laughs> so he is he is a named creature from real world mythology, and he's not legendary, which I think, which just tickles my brain. And that's, of course, because the first expansion for magic was Arabian Nights and Legends came a set or two later. And so... <laughs> Uh, which legends invented legends. And so uh, there was not the idea of a legendary creature at this point. So Arabian Nights has a couple of named named creatures who are not legends, which uh, I just think is wonderful. That is pretty fun. <laughs> there's there's some gatherer comments that are very, very confused by him not being legendary and then other comments explaining what you just explained. <laughs> that totally sounds like, uh, yes, a gatherer conversation. I don't think there's too much to say about this card from a design perspective for me. I do think he has kind of a fun, flashy effect, like stealing artifacts is pretty cool. I think he's been a little bit overshadowed by the other two Aladdin things in Arabian Nights. So Arabian Nights has uh, Aladdin's lamp and Aladdin's ring as well. Um, those are two also, I, I think, pretty iconic, really expensive artifacts. So uh, the lamp costs 10 mana. Uh, and the ring costs eight mana. Those are both sort of famously some of the most expensive cards in Magic. Uh, The lamp in particular, uh, it was the first thing to have a double digit mana cost and they didn't have a 10 mana mana symbol invented at the time. And so they instead printed it with two fives side by side. It looks like 55. I love that. um, Which I think was widely misinterpreted uh, if I had to guess as just 55 mana. So if you haven't seen that original Arabian Nights printing of Aladdin's lamp, look it up. It's pretty funny. I don't know what would be more confusing, though, to have one zero or five five. I've thought about this a lot. I think one zero is substantially less confusing. Less confusing. Oh, yeah. You think it's more? I, f- I kind of feel like it's more because if I was looking at the. I mean, maybe maybe I'm, I'm carrying too much of a like modern magic sensibility into this when, you know, where we we have zero mana costs fairly commonly. Um, but mm-hmm. I would kind of think if I was like a new player way back then <laughs> projecting myself back into the early nineties, uh, when I was probably two, 
I, I feel like if I saw one and zero, I think, okay, so it's one. And then maybe they, for some reason, they forgot to take out this zero or something huh. like that. But if I see five and five, you know, there's no way it costs 55 mana. So it must huh. be five mana plus another five mana, but neither, neither one is good. Yeah. I think both are pretty unintuitive. Um, yeah. I do like that Aladdin, there are two artifacts in the set that bear his name and he steals artifacts. I think that's a nice little bit of uh, um, symmetry in the design of the set. Yeah, that's fun. And he, he is holding the lamp. That's right. Does he have in a ring art. on? I don't think so. Where's your ring, Aladdin? Maybe it's in his pocket. One thing I I sort of enjoy about uh, this card a lot is it's it's one of those old, like very old art pieces in Magic where you can absolutely see that it's done by hand. Not necessarily in a in a good way, <laughs> the way we've talked about some cards that have a really nice kind of painterly handmade quality this this looks like handmade like you can see the colored pencil marks you can, <laughs> you can see you know which which crayola colors they were choosing i i think the the background here really is colored pencil and maybe aladdin himself is also colored pencil which i kind of love like there's there's something very fun about seeing that kind of art on like an actual playable magic card yeah, it's true. It's uh, it's interesting looking at Julie Barrow's art generally. I, you're right. It does all look like, I think, colored pencil. I'm not super good at identifying mediums. Uh, it looks like her last pieces appeared in a lion. No, she had one uh, solitary piece in Tempest. But she only did 24, 26 pieces total, and they were mostly in Alpha, Arabian Nights, and uh, Legends, with just a handful coming later. There's also a, uh, a comment I saw in Gatherer that um, confused me a lot and, and maybe maybe shows that I understand nothing about the meta that this commenter is talking about. Uh, <laughs> but one guy on there said, Aladdin wins most games in Master's Edition 4 Limited. I've had people concede as soon as I cast him. Wow. Huh. So I just, I, I'm really curious like what I'm, I'm missing about that. I, I believe Master's Edition was uh, like an online only set release, right? Yeah, it was one of those MTGO sets that was just existed to get, you know, cards that would otherwise never have made it into Magic Online, into Magic Online. So a lot right. of weird first printings. I know nothing about that. I, I think most people probably don't know much about that format. But it looks like 65 out of 226 cards in the set are artifacts. So that's like, what, a quarter? So I assume it's just there was such a huge density of artifacts that this guy was just a just a boss. Yeah, I wonder if there uh, there was maybe some handful of artifacts that were just you know run in every deck or something um i'm looking a lot most of the artifacts are really i think this might have been just a bad format in general looking at it but while most of the artifacts are pretty bad there's a few uh decent ones like uh juggernaut is worth stealing um yeah after that it get, goes downhill pretty quick into like Ebony rhino oh icy manipulator was in it and then just a lot of weird stuff like korma spell and living wall and funny janky cards yeah, yeah. I just hmm. uh, I couldn't. I I sort of scrolled through the artifacts and I was like, what? Uh, what is forcing people to concede when they see Aladdin here? If anyone here was an expert listening was an expert on Master's Edition four, please let us know because I I feel like that's obscure knowledge that we want to tap. So, uh, what kind of rating would you give Aladdin? Oh wait, I have one. I have one more thing to say about Aladdin, which is that um, I was curious if this guy sees play in old school ninety three, ninety four, or any of the other kind of old school Magic formats that have popped up in the last few years. Uh, I couldn't really find any reference, unfortunately, to Aladdin seeing play, uh, which is a little bit of a bummer. Um, he is a cool combo with a antiquities card called Ashnod's Transmigrant, which is a one mana artifact that you can tap. Uh, and sack it to put a counter on target non-artifact creature. That creature becomes an artifact in addition to its other type. So I do think that's kind of cool that he can, uh, you can use Ashnod's Transmigrant to steal any creature. Fun, fun little combo. Yeah, that's that's fun to think about. Uh, where did I land? I, I had him as a C just because, again, I think he's a fun, unique effect. Although I also take your earlier point that almost all these cards have interesting, unique effects. So C might be generous, but I like, I guess I like just the fact he's from Arabian Nights. I sort of biased me because I have a soft spot for that set. Mm, yeah, I, I landed on on D. I mean, he's not he's not great, but uh, he's, he's definitely given us a lot to talk about. Uh, I'm OK going down to D. The art is weak here. It doesn't seem to have much competitive history. I think D is fine. Come on down to D. Okay, next up, we have Amplifier. The last four letters of that are F-I-R-E. Amplifier, 2-R-R -R for a 1-1 elemental, of course. 
At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card. Until your next turn, Amplifier's base power becomes twice that card's power, and its base toughness becomes twice that card's toughness. Put the revealed cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. I I felt like Amplifier is kind of gold compared to what we've seen so far. <laughs> uh, just just the, the fact that he can become anything more than a 1-1 one, one gives him a lot of points compared to the, the couple of Aki and Aladdin that hmm. we've looked at. That's true. He's one of only two who can do that. Yeah, who who can become bigger than those those measly stats, and it it just has a lot of like basic Timmy kind of appeal to me. You know the the idea of not just getting bigger, but doubling the power and toughness of whatever you happen to reveal. Like it it encourages you to have some some big creatures that you might hopefully draw into uh, to make amplifier even bigger. It's 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 the kind of card that would get young Connor very excited as a magic player. Yeah, I agree. This card has just a, a big fun factor. I think the one thing it's really missing is like some keyword or some additional clause. Like, I feel like if you threw trample on this guy, just trample and nothing else, um, you would then have a pretty fun, like kind of, you know, a saffron olive against the odds type card where you fill your deck with like death shadow or Galta or something or a bunch of other big fatties and try to ramp out an amplifier and get a one turn kill. So I, I feel like there's a little bit of a missed opportunity here. If I, I, you know, I'm normally not a fan of modern magic cards doing all your work for you. Um, but I feel like in this case, just doing a little bit of an extra favor with the keyword would have made this card really sing instead of, you know, merely hum. Hmm. That's yeah, that's fair. He's also, this is uh, one of my hobby horses, so forgive me, but I feel like Amplifier is an example of the kind of card that had, had a nice home in like casual magic, kind of old school kitchen table 60 card decks, but just has no home in EDH, right? Like there's just no, turning this thing into a 1010 or even a 2020 is just not good in EDH, unfortunately, even though I think in a dual magic environment at a low power level, this could have done some fun, interesting things. So I, it just bums me out a little bit that cards like this really have nowhere to go nowadays. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's also fair. There's there's some sort of fun fun surprise cards in here that sort of do have a role in in EDH, even though they were printed at a time when uh, it barely existed as a, as a format. Uh, this is not one of them. Nope, unfortunately not. Uh, so I'm relatively down on ratings for this uh, for amplifier. I have it as a D delta. Hmm. I gave it a B because I think it's just it's. It's just sort of fun. Like it's it's not it's not good. It's not the the most interesting card that we'll talk about today. But it's like I don't know. It's just something about maybe it's just doubling. Like having double <laughs> on this card, That's not true. just once but twice. Something about that really uh, appeals. Yeah, I'm with you there. Double is an intrinsically cool, fun thing to have on a card. Uh, you know, I'm willing to go all the way up to B. B's B's fine with me. All right, double upgrade to B. All right, our final Champions of Kamigawa inspiring card. I think this is the card uh, when we reached this point where we said, okay, we got to do an episode about this uh, concept. Ben Ben, Aki Hermit, 2RR for a, yes, 1-1, one, one, Legendary Creature Goblin Shaman. Tap, Ben Ben deals damage to target attacking creature equal to the number of untapped mountains you control. Okay, so we've already talked about Ben Ben a little bit, so uh, I'm sure you've all listened to all of the Red episode of uh, this podcast, and so we don't need to delve into it again. But just a couple things to quickly say in defense of Ben Ben um, before we explain how bad he is. I think it's fun that he has a totally unique ability. I don't think there's any other card magic that does something does this or even anything that's similar to this. Um, and more importantly, I think his the thing he has most going for him is he has great art and a fun backstory. Um, I love the little squid on his head. I love the way he's kind of cowering away in the corner. I love the way uh, Ben Ben has like lost his mind and actually kills his own kind through his traps. I just think he's he's a fun, flavorful design that unfortunately is also bad. Yeah, yeah, agree, agree on all of that. I, I, I love, love his art, but I feel like the rest of him, I look at it and there are just so many sort of if only moments you know, oh. if only he didn't cost four, if only he was a little bit stronger or, you know, was maybe a, a zero three or zero four. Yes. He has such a defensive ability. Uh, if only the mountains that impact the strength of his ability didn't need to be untapped. Uh, if only the ability could target more than just attacking creatures. Like there's so many uh... little things that could be tweaked here to make him better. I don't know if they would make him 
playable even, but that would that would make him more than just unplayably bad. Yeah, the untapped thing I think is the real kick in the shins here. Like there's already so much conditionality and limitations inherent to this card. And then the fact that they have to be untapped, it's like, come on, let me let him just be an impenetrable wall until they manage to kill your one one. Right. And and in red too, you know, the the color where you're you're like ideally least likely to have many up, untapped lands like this yeah. this sort of encourages unfun play for you yeah it's like a weird defensive play style that red just doesn't support yeah and as we talked about in kamigawa that like there really isn't anything else in red in that set even that helps ben ben i i really feel like he was let down on his art um or I, this art should not have been wasted on this uh this uh set of abilities because i think if ben ben was good this would be kind of an iconic piece it's so unique yeah, for sure. Um, one more note on Ben Ben before we get to ratings. The influence of the clock spinning podcast, I believe, has led to an explosion in Ben Ben's popularity on EDH rec. So when we reviewed him just five short months ago in April, he had a mere 61 decks. Now he has 91 decks. And at this growth rate, next year he could be at 137. Um, so I just, Whoa. I think that's that's amazing. That's wild. The The 50% clock spinning bump. That's right. And if if it keeps going, which I'm sure it will, uh, as you all share out links to our back catalog with all of your friends and family, we could see Ben Ben easily being, you know, in the top 10 most popular red commanders in five years. I think so. Well, uh, I have more good news to add to that. Great news. Uh, okay. Also coming from EDH, <laughs> right? When I did the the ratings for these cards, I happened upon the EDH rec homepage, like the main landing page. And the commander of the day, I don't really know what that means over there, but the commander of the day was Goto Bandit Warlord. Whoa. So that's that's just one step away from Ben Ben Aki Hermit. It really is. So uh, don't sleep on Ben Ben. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hesitate to even ask how we rated him. How did you rate him? He's, he's a D for me. He'd be an F if not for the art, but <laughs> he's a D. Yeah, I'm right there with you. He's a solid D, unfortunately. A not solid D. Yeah. All right. I think we both feel a, a little bit better ratings-wise about the next high card. On this one. Bomb Squad. 3R for a 1-1 one, one dwarf. Tap to put a fuse counter on target creature. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a fuse counter on each creature with a fuse counter on it. And whenever a creature has four or more fuse counters on it, remove all of them and destroy it that creature deals four damage to its controller. <laughs> I really, really love this card. Um, the The effect is just so much fun to think about. These these dwarves putting fuse counters on uh, all of your opponent's creatures and those just slowly ticking away, blowing up their board and, and dealing damage to the opponent at the same time. I love that it comes with this four damage to face so that it can also be a very unlikely win condition for you. <laughs> um I love the kind of ironic name of this being a, a bomb squad, which, of course, we typically think of as uh, def defusing bombs, but instead they are adding fuses. Uh, <laughs> the, the art kind of adds to the confusion because it, it shows these three dwarves who appear to be standing in the middle of it's super an explosion. <laughs> it looks like they, they are about to be exploded by uh, the bombs. And they look incredibly distressed. They do. They it, like they look like they are being detonated instead of doing the detonating. Um, so I just there's so many things to love here. Yeah, there must have been a major miscommunication between the art director and Greg and Tim Hildebrandt, um, the artists on this card, because this art makes no sense. No, none at all. It, it looks like it would maybe be like for a, a fire kind of spell that destroys a creature <laughs> yeah, like a relatively impotent one because honestly yeah. they look like they're more like put out rather than like dying <laughs> yeah like they they kind of look like they are seeing something that they really wish they hadn't seen yeah I, there's a lot of things i like about this card one of the things i like is that the color pie on it is pretty weird like blowing up creatures feels like it belongs in red creatures dealing damage to their opponent feels like it belongs or to their controller, feels like it belongs in red. Destroying a creature unconditionally feels pretty strange in red. And in that sense, this card kind of reminds me of like cards from Alpha, where there's a lot of cards in Alpha that today we would describe as color pie violations, things like Psionic Blast um, or Prodigal Sorcerer, that are in that color just because it feels thematically right and flavorfully right. 
Um, and th- this reminds me of an alpha design, uh, not just in that kind of color pie break, but in the like sort of uh, Baroque mechanical complexity of it. Like it's trying to do something that's pretty simple to explain, but that requires just a ton of words to like actually make happen. Uh, so yeah, I-, I get a kick out of this card just from a mechanical and design standpoint. It's pretty unique. Yeah, that's that's a the good point about a good point about the Baroque aspect of this, and it's it's a very kind of top down design. Yeah, super top down. <laughs> this idea of uh, slowly blowing up your opponent's creatures and the you know the the mechanics and the way that the cards written are sort of awkwardly forced into that that fun idea. Yeah, one thing I think today this the fuse counter itself would come with the rules text about ticking up every upkeep. And then dealing damage uh, when it blows up, uh, and I think that would be a slightly more interesting card because it is kind of a bummer. This has to stick around for what five turns past four turns past the turn it was cast in order to kill its first creature, which is pretty brutal. Well, no, it it takes up on its own. Oh, I see. Four, four it, turns. Yeah, four of your next. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's yeah, true. So you gotta pass the turn because it doesn't have haste, and then the next turn you put the first fuse counter. I guess you could put a bunch on one creature. That's kind of interesting. You could either pile a bunch on one creature to blow it up quicker in two turns, or you could distribute them around. So it's kind of a risk reward thing. That's cool. Yeah, Bomb Squad does it all. I know. I think this is the most popular card we've talked about so far in EDH terms. It's in 867 decks, which is not a ton, but it's more than some of the others. And that largely seems to be on the back of all of these commander dwarven commanders we've gotten in the last five or 10 years. So uh, this appears in fully 14% of Magda Brazen Outlaw decks, who is a, a dwarf who likes to see other dwarves become tapped. Uh, which seems like a great fit. Depala Pilot Exemplar, where I don't really see much synergy, honestly. Uh, and Torbrand Thane of Redfell, who has red sources deal more damage, which is also kind of nice. Oh, wait, no, the creature deals the damage. So there's no synergy with Torbrand. That's too bad. There is synergy with Tok Tok, though. <laughs> that, that's true. So... Um, Aki, Lava Runner, Bomb Squad, Tribal Deck. Love it. Okay, one more uh, little bit of trivia before we get to ratings on this. In 2005, back when Mark Rosewater wrote fun, quirky columns, he wrote a column called 32 Short Columns About Dwarves, because there were 32 dwarves at that point in Magic. And so he wrote 32 little, I guess you could call them mini columns. A lot of them are kind of just bad jokes or pictures or uh, other wacky things. But he included this twice in that column, which made me happy. It doesn't really get any funny jokes, unfortunately. It gets some pretty lazy jokes. He also, I thought this was great. He did a bracket on his Twitter a couple of years ago where he was trying to figure out the best counter in Magic. Uh-huh. Uh, and this was the first vote in the bracket. And this fuse counters from this card went head to head with plus one, plus one counters, which just feels really unfair. <laughs> That's awesome. Is this the only card with fuse counters? No, I think there's actually a couple others. Let me go look. While I'm looking that up, this actually um, managed 9.5% in that poll against plus one, plus one counters, which honestly isn't that's too awesome. bad. I would say that's an overperformance. There are four cards with fuse counters. So um, a Goblin Bomb from Weatherlight, uh, Incendiary, and Powder Keg, both from Urza's Destiny. So this is one of four cards in Magic that create fuse counters. Fuse Counter Tribal. I'm going to guess the polling love was for Goblin Bomb, which is a little bit more of an iconic card than this. So Bomb Squad is a a definite S tier for me. Whoa. You know what, Connor? It's also an S tier for me. Oh. Synchronicity. All right. We finally got an S tier um, after a, a whole string of C's and F's. See, we told you there are interesting cards in here. Yeah, there's good, there's good stuff. This is good good card pool in this episode. All right. Next up, we have Cinder Seer. 3R for a 1-1 one, one wizard. I think he's probably a human wizard now. 2R tap. Reveal any number of red cards in your hand. Cinder Seal de- Seer deals X damage to any target where X is the number of cards revealed this way. Cinder Seer is part of an entire uh, mediocre Urza's Destiny cycle of Seers who are all uh, four mana one ones. I'll link them all from the show notes if you want to go uh, look at all of these disappointing cards. Um, and they all do little color appropriate effects. Uh, this is back in the day when Wizards insisted on a little too much symmetry in cycles. So all of these cards are four mana. All of them are one ones. All of them have the same activation cost, even though their abilities are pretty disparate. So Cinder Seal, Seer deals X damage, which... I think it's pretty darn good. Brine Seer and Blue counters unless its controller pays X mana. 
Ivy Seer in green gives plus X plus X until end of turn. Jasmine Seer in white gains you two life for each card you reveal. Um, and Nightshade Seer gives minus X minus X to a creature. So we have four that are kind of interesting and have decent effects. And then we have the poor white one, which as is traditional is terrible. That whole cycle also, all five cards are done by the same artist, Donato Giancola. And Cinder Seer, at least for me, is definitely the best of that cycle. So probably the best on power level, best on art power level. Yeah, I agree. Some of the others are kind of like a little weird. Like they're they're all a little bit too still and boring. Yeah. So they they all have they you know all feature a humanoid subject. I was about to say human, but Ivy Seer looks pretty pretty elven. All of these these figures are you know positioned in front of some sort of stylized background. So Nightshade Seer, for example, has what looks like uh, like a stained glass window behind him. Jasmine Seer, it looks like just has a, maybe a chalk drawing on a wall. <laughs> she even uh, got the latest, she, latest background. <laughs> she really did. Uh, but then Cinder Seer has this really cool tile mosaic of uh, what I would guess is a volcano erupting. And it looks like there's also kind of a hydra coming out of the volcano. The, the actual wizard, the actual seer is not that interesting, but his background looks pretty cool. And I wish there was more of this kind of like abstract, abstract design in modern magic art. Yeah, they're bringing some of it back with the sagas, which I appreciate. Like a lot of the sagas are kind of have this yeah, pretty photorealistic true. abstract art. Um, yeah, if you're not familiar with Donato Giancola's uh, art, it's worth looking up. He's sometimes, I think, known as, I don't know if he's called literally the master of hands, but <laughs> that's how I think of him. He's this kind of like photorealistic, almost like kind of Renaissance style paintings um, yeah. that are tend to be really detailed, um, really painterly still at the same time. They often have really realistic portraiture or really realistic depictions of human hands. Um, and he's done some just really iconic, uh, amazing pieces like cartographer and magic, uh, from Odyssey is sometimes cited as like the greatest piece of magic art in the history of the game in terms of technical execution. Uh, and he's just done a bunch of other wonderful pieces. So he's worth looking up for sure. He's also still making art. They've like given him contracts in the last year or two, which is great because he's still putting out banging pieces. Like looks like he did invoke despair in neon dynasty. Yeah. He's, uh, he's pretty prolific. Yeah. 202 unique arts. That's pretty good. Uh, that said, I'm still an E on this. Uh, the second lowest grade. I couldn't quite go to F because the art is, uh, to be honest, I like the mosaic more than the guy. I think the guy is kind of uh, awkward looking, but I just, I don't know. This is just so boring. Like the mechanics here are just so just, just super uninteresting to me. Yeah. I, I gave this a, a C, I think just entirely on the That's strength generous. of the art. <laughs> I think it is generous. And I Look, I'm ben ben, revise if ben that ben to a was D. a, was a D with that art, I don't think this goes all the way to C. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. I can't do that to Ben Ben. I'll I'll knock this down to a, a D. D. All right, it's still the same grade as Ben Ben, which I think is a little little unfair, but that's fine. Yeah. Well, I I think that I'm I'm adding even more unfairness because part of my rating for this is is wishing that there were more mosaic backgrounds in Magic cards. <laughs> So I'm, to, uh, I'm not even to really incentivize wizards to do more yeah, mosaics. Yeah, and I and I'm not even really rating Cinders here at this point. I'm just rating one part of the art. I feel like Theros Beyond Death definitely had at least one. Okay, Theros Beyond Death had one mosaic. Elspeth conquers death. So the most famous saga in that set had a had a mosaic art. Connor, not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. All right. That's true. I'll, I'll allow it. All right. We settling on D. Yeah, D's, D's fine. D is generous, but I'll let you have it. Speaking of D, our next card is Diao Chen, Artful Beauty. 3R for a 1-1 one, one legend. Uh, on your turn, before you attack, you may tap Diao Chen to destroy any one creature. Then your opponent destroys any one creature of his or her choice. And I'm just, I'm reading straight from the card, not the Oracle text. Uh, so it probably sounds a little bit different now, but you get you get the idea. Once per turn, before combat, you can... You can tap her to destroy any creature, and then an opponent uh, destroys any creature of their choice. So the 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 first thing that kind of struck me about this card is how much love there is for her on uh, gatherer comments, specifically in the context of EDH. And actually, I think I need to read the proper oracle text for this to make sense. Uh, modern Diao Chan says, destroy target creature of your choice, then destroy target creature of an opponent's choice. 
activate only during mm. your turn before attackers are declared. So mm. the kind of political shenanigans enabled by this card are hidden by the text on the original printing because oh, what, the second the second creature doesn't have to be yours exactly it does not have to be yours oh, and wow. the opponent does not have to be the opponent whose creature you targeted i'm changing my rating right now i, I totally missed that <laughs> subtlety that's awesome so there's there's this whole sort of uh idea of you know a, a Diao Chan political shenanigans deck in like a four-player edh game where you are using Diao Chan to destroy an opponent's creature and then sort of bargaining with all of the other players uh to give them the ability to destroy another creature um so there's this there's some really fun nuances that come out of the wording of this card that obviously was printed at a time when this format of magic was not even really thought about yeah that is amazing and it also explains why uh the portal three kingdoms version of this card is 144 us dollars <laughs> Because that is a pretty, especially in red, I mean, I think that's basically a completely unique effect for red. Yeah, it also explains why uh, she was printed in Commander's Arsenal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have too much to add to that. It's an interesting effect. Um, it looks like she also commands 177 decks, which isn't many, but it's some. And it looks like that's largely kind of meme politics-y decks. So for example, she's played a lot with a card called Vicious Shadows, um, which is 6R... For an enchantment, whenever a creature dies, you may have Vicious Shadows deal damage to target player equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. So you kind of double up on the trolling uh, with killing things here, which I think is pretty wonderful. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, pretty cool. It's also from Portal Three Kingdoms, which I like. Um, you know, just any card from that super weird uh, set is is fun to think about. Have Have we ever talked about that set before during the Kamigawa set review? No, I don't think so. Do you feel uh, competent to talk about it? I feel like I don't know the details as well as I should. Um, I don't know very, very much about it either. I mean, it was uh, P- Portal was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, basically a, a set that was sort of a, a back to basics with magic and a, a way of hypothetically introducing the, the game to newer players with simpler cards and simpler mechanics. Right. By taking out all the interesting parts of the game, like instance and most activated abilities and most keyword abilities and uh, mo- many of the other, I think artifacts, many of the other things that made the game, make the game interesting. Yeah, uh, were exactly. Uh, there's also some kind of uh, unique or not unique, but, but interesting printing decisions that were made in portal. They're all white border cards. Uh, the power toughness numbers have little sword and shield symbols next to them, which honestly seems like a good idea that I'm surprised they never adopted. It, it sort of it seems like a good idea, but at the same time, to me, it's like that's the the least confusing part of the <laughs> part of understanding creature. a magic card. Yeah, you just have to remember the one on the left is power, and the other one is toughness. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, so so it's it's extra fun to me that a card like this that's now enabling political shenanigans in EDH was you know originally printed in a set that was kind of dumbing the game down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, of course, is from Portal Three Kingdoms, which is, I don't know a huge amount about the backstory, but basically there was Portal, and then that was sort of a commercial failure, and so they released another Portal set, (laughs) Portal Second Age, uh, which was also something of a commercial failure. So then, um, and was also the only set in Magic to have guns for like 20 years, Um, and then Portal Three Kingdoms came along as another beginner set, I believe intended specifically for the Chinese market to help Magic break into China, and so it's all... um, Three Romance of the Three Kingdoms themed. Uh, all of these legends are characters from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Many of the card names are lines from Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And unlike the other portal sets, it came with a lot of interesting, unique effects that in many cases were, for example, relabelings of classic cards. So there's Wildfire, for example, which is a powerful sorcery that destroys all lands and deals four damage to each creature. Um, and then there was a um, functional reprint of that whose name is Tempor- The Burning of Jin Ye. Um, which is exactly the same card. So uh, Portal Three Kingdoms sees a lot of play in EDH um, because it has functional reprints of cards like uh, Wildfire or um, Diabolic Tutor and other uh, epically powerful cards. Or not Diabolic Tutor, whatever the one mana lose two life tutor is. See, see, you know, you know about this. Yeah, I, I just had to, I had to ramp up to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's your rating on uh, Dao Chan? Uh, she's a, she's an A for me. Doesn't quite make it to S tier, but just the the shenanigans aspect is enough to get it to a yeah i'm totally i'm right there with you a sounds good i think if she had better art i would put her at s but the art is pretty boring 
It it kind of reminds me, I don't know why, I like I literally just thought of this, but it kind of reminds me of like a children's book. Like maybe if if you uh-huh. have like a children's storybook of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms that was <laughs> I illustrated, totally see that, yes. would be something like this. What is uh, what is the flavor behind this card? Is she? So I don't know Romance of the Three Kingdoms at all, so I'm just going to go by the art and the effect. And I'm thinking the effect is she's seducing these two gentlemen here into killing each other. I that seems like a very good guess to me. I think I think I had read somewhere that she's not actually character in the original like Romance of the Three Kingdoms stories. No way. So okay, here we go. It was a gatherer comment. So if you trust Sky Knight, she back in November of 2013, then here's the story. <laughs> That's who I get all my Chinese history from. Definitely. Interesting thing about her is that unlike most other uh, Portal 3 personalities, she doesn't seem to be a historical figure. Chinese records at the time don't refer to anyone like her romance of the Three Kingdoms. I'm not sure. De- depiction? Uh, <laughs> Gatherer bleeped out part of this next word, so I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. <laughs> I love Gatherer censorship. She's largely endemic to popular understandings slash depictions of the Shu Wei Wu conflict. Whether she originated with Romance of the Three Kingdoms, I have no idea. Mostly to give Lu Bu more reason to betray Dong Zhuo. Huh. So there you go. Yeah, no, looking at her Wikipedia page, it looks like, yes, she's a character, mostly fictional character in Romance of the Three Kingdoms with a very small historical basis. But yeah, largely uh, invented for the novel. So there you go. All right, solid A. She's earned it. Okay, let's talk about Ember Mage Goblin. 3R for a 1-1 Goblin Wizard. When Ember Mage Goblin enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a card named Ember Mage Goblin. Reveal it and put it into your hand. If you do, shuffle. Tap Ember Mage Goblin deals one damage to any target. Okay, uh, so this may not look like much, but this card actually has some interesting history. This is one of the first two non-legendary Red Tims. And if that means nothing to you, <laughs> let me unpack it. Uh, cards that are pingers in magic, cards that tap to deal one damage, creatures that tap to deal one damage, are often called Tims. And that's a nickname going all the way back to uh, the card Prodigal Sorcerer in uh, Alpha, which uh, whose art looked a little bit like uh, the wizard in Monty Python and the Holy Grail and who dealt damage. And so therefore he was quickly nicknamed Tim, uh, as the wizard is in Holy Grail is famously called. Um, and strangely, for the first like seven or eight years of magic's history, this ability to tap and deal one damage was almost exclusively a blue thing. So um, I'll have a link to all these blue Tims uh, in the show notes, but basically R&D kept printing um, blue Tims all the way through 1999 and would not let red get a kind of unconditional, no drawback, no cost to activate, just tap to deal damage creature. Uh, So even as R&D is merrily printing these blue cards. All of the red ones have these terrible (laughs) conditionality or side effects. So for example, Orcish Artillery uh, in Alpha deals two damage to any target, but three damage to you. Um, Orcish Cannoneers is a reprint of that that does the same thing. I'm just picking it random here. Anaba Shaman uh, costs mana to activate. Fire Slinger deals one to any target and one to you. Uh, Many of them require themselves to die in order to be used. So all of these come with drawbacks until basically Kamal Pitfighter uh, in Odyssey, who is able to just tap and deal three damage, but who costs six mana. And then finally, in Onslaught, Wizard says, okay, 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 this is this is a red ability. We admit it. Uh, and so they give us Ember Mage Goblin. And then unfortunately for Ember Mage Goblin's place in history, they gave us one other uh, pinging card at the same time, which is a card called Goblin Sharpshooter. Goblin Sharpshooter, uh, if you're not familiar with it, was a competitive powerhouse back in Onslaught block. And it's basically a Tim that untaps every time a creature dies. And so the Sharpshooter can quickly machine gun down an entire board pretty much out of nowhere. So that's a a short history of Tims in Magic. Cool, unique effect with a weirdly complicated backstory. And actually, as as I'm looking through the uh, list of blue Tims, the original Tims, (laughs) there. There was a Tim, not only in Portal, the original Portal, but also a uh, Three Kingdoms Tim called Wu Longbowman. Of course, it's important you introduce new players. And there was one in Second Age, Apprentice Sorcerer. <laughs> there, was a, there was a Tim in all three of these sets. <laughs> <laughs> so so they were really committed to, to Timness back then. Oh my, they're all functional reprints of Tim. They're all three mana one ones that tap to deal, deal one damage um, yeah. to any target. Though they all have to do it before you attack. Yeah, that was a weird thing in Portal 3 King uh, Portal. They wanted to not yeah. have the complexity of main phase two. It's super silly. Dao Chen has the same uh same issue. Yeah, I think Ember Mage Goblin is is 
a lot of fun. He's, you know, he's not the same kind of, um, he's not going to have the machine gunning potential of sharpshooter, but I, I love the idea of, you know, this goblin that's pulling out another one and uh, maybe another one after that. And you sort of building this little small army of pinging goblins. I don't think that necessarily makes him good or even a goblin that you'd want to have in a goblin deck, but it's fun to think about. Yeah, I agree. This card's pretty fun. Like in limited, it's fun to think if I get five or six of those, is that good? Or is that just a terrible idea? Um, And in like a, this is another one of my like fun casual cards with no home in EDH. Like it would never be good, but the idea of getting three or four of these is pretty fun. And in fact, like dealing three damage every turn cycle would be, would be pretty dang good. Admittedly, you would have put 12 mana in, but what you're going to do? You know, small, small detail. What is not fun to me about this card is the art. So the the goblin here is in this really, really awkward, st- like a, a stiff pose that's meant to look dynamic because of the angles of his body hmm. Hmm. Um, and sort of the, the shape of this, this ember that he's firing out. But everything's just kind of off about it, like the, the angle of the sort of fireball or fire disc that's coming out of his hands doesn't look right uh it doesn't look like the ember is going where he's aiming it the pose is all off there's really no background here at all to the art and he's just kind of standing on like featureless dirt so not a fan of that part of it yeah it's pretty uninspired can i can i give you something to make this art even more i think you used the word uncomfortable at one point um can Mm -hmm. you click on this link that i have uh here that says nsfw Oh boy. So the orig- is this going to make it into the show notes? Uh, yeah, this will be in the show notes, but genuinely a little bit of a content warning here. So um, this card, uh, I think originally had some art that Wizards took a look at and said, no, 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 we cannot print this like this. Um, but they forgot to take it out of the foil sheet. And so the foil versions of this card have some um, pretty obscene artwork. So I just encourage you to go uh, go check it out. Oh, oh no. I know. Oh, it, it takes a second. <laughs> when you see yeah, it. Yeah, once you see it, it's uh it's very unfortunate. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, go uh, go take a look. Okay. Um where so I have this in an A. I don't really know what came over me. I don't think this is an A. I, I'm prepared to downgrade as far as you want to take me. So what do, what do you have this at? I mean, this is this is a C for me. Is C too generous even? I feel like we should both downgrade. <laughs> like the more I talk about it. Maybe even D. I mean if if I if I give the art a little more negative weight here, which I feel like I should after what you just revealed to me, um, I think that brings it down to D. I mean, we gave Aladdin a D. This can't be better than Aladdin. Oh, you want to go all the way down? I, at least a D. I, I think I insist on a D, maybe even an E. I'm fine with D, but like this card's pretty lame, and it's also probably traumatized a generation of children with its obscene foil artwork. You know, on on that note, I I feel like D is the only letter we can give it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Let's give it a big D. (laughs) Okay, big D. Moving right along from that, we have Fallen Pharomancer. 3R for a 1-1 human shaman with infect, uh, which means that this creature deals damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus one counters, and to players in the form of poison counters. You can tap Fallen Pharomancer and pay one R to deal one damage to target creature or player. Uh, And if you're not familiar with poison counters, the way that those work is if a player has 10 poison counters, they lose the game. So this is, you know, obviously the the same kind of Tim pinging effect as the Ember Mage Goblin, but uh, of course you need to pay for it, two mana, uh, which seems a bit steep for me. Uh, But the, the added wrinkle of infect here makes this card a, I, I can't say a lot more interesting because it's it's a pretty straightforward card but a little bit more interesting and you know feels like there's some it, it makes you want to build an infect deck every infect card makes me want to do that but yeah yeah this uh i think the the best thing for this card is definitely the it's a good example of the emergent gameplay of magic or the emergent design right you take this totally bog standard red ability um, you know, pinging something and then you add infect and it plays totally differently. And I think that's pretty wonderful. That said, I think the card itself here is like, uh, I don't know. It could be, it could do more. I find the art here competent, but uninspired. Like it's well executed, but it's not interesting to me. Uh, and I totally agree that the two cost, uh, in order to tap this thing is come on, just let it be one or even zero, man. I don't think it would have been too good. Certainly at one man, I would have been fine. 
Right. And I mean, even even at no mana, the fact that it's a 1-1, one, one, you know, <laughs> like the chances of this sticking around long enough to uh, be a meaningful threat in the form of poison counters is just pretty low. Um, I will say on the art, though, uh, someone on Gatherer commented that they could just picture him screaming, does this look infected to you? <laughs> and that, okay. that does feel like the perfect line for this art. Hmm. I can see that, yeah. yeah. Uh, one other little thing to say in this guy's favor is it's pretty fun with the uh, the Scorpion God uh, as your commander. So the Scorpion God um, notably has the ability, whenever a creature with a minus one, minus one counter on it dies, draw a card. And so this, you know, essentially allows you to shrink a thing and like queue up card draw, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there's some potential there. Yeah. I, uh, what kind of rating do you give this? I gave it a B, but I feel like I went through a little generous spell in the middle that I don't really buy. I feel like this is kind of a classic C, like it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I landed at C. I'm probably going to, this feels like a card I'm going to forget about, like literally as soon as I scroll down in the spreadsheet. So I feel like anything more than C is too much. Okay, let's talk about um, what might be the most forgettable card in this whole uh, episode. Firefly, 3R for an insect with flying, and R, Firefly, gets plus one, plus O until end of turn. So it's a fire-breathing, flying, 1-1. One, one. I, I got to give a credit to the rest of our four mana 1-1s. One, I think this is the first truly boring card. I, I do g- give it some credit for being comprehensively boring. The name is boring, Firefly. The effect is really boring. Uh, this is on a bunch of other cards. The art is super boring. It's just like a slightly anthropomorphic firefly, but there's really nothing interesting. It certainly doesn't look like it could be like a 6-1. Six, six the only thing I'll give it is the flavor text is very slightly funny, which is if they don't pinch, they burn. Can't you eat any of the bugs here? Squee, goblin deck, cabin hand. So that's uh, that's kind of funny. Uh, goblins eat bugs. That's, that's funny. But yeah, this card is just a dog. Yeah, there's just so many things to be to be sad about. Like you, you look at it, and it's a, my, you know, the first question is why? Why is it an insect? You know, it, it has fire breathing, a classic dragon ability. There already is a dragon whelp that is a four mana two three. So just mm. just what is Firefly doing anywhere? You know, when when would you ever want this this miserable little bug? Yeah, I think the unfortunate answer is it's doing like nothing ever you know, in any, in any set. Yeah. That's a great point about Dragon Whelp of like Dragon Whelp was like printed in alpha. So if they wanted like a four mana flyer with fire breathing, like they already had that technology available to them in a much more interesting and iconic card. Yeah. This, this is the, the, the first and maybe not, not quite the only, but definitely the first card we've talked about in this episode where I just kind of go, why, like, why does this exist? Yeah, it's super uninspired. Uh, I think the general consensus is that this card is uninspired. It has only it's in only eight decks on EDH rec, which might be like literally the lowest number I've ever seen for any card. And and all eight of those decks, why? Well, if you look at them, they're just like it's almost like just random lists of cards. Like you yeah. could almost believe they were made by bots. If you look at like what it appears alongside, it's like it appears alongside wa- wandering ones. Oh, you know what? These might be somewhat meme decks because I see it with wandering ones. Scornful egotist, like really, really bad cards. I don't know. I, just, just the worst of the worst. Yeah, I'm thinking nobody has any love for this card. There's nothing to love. No, nope. this is just an easy F, right? Yeah, that's a, it's a definite F. Okay, our next card is Goblin Fire Fiend. Speaking of F, boo. Three Sorry, R. I just want to get it started? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of F, three R for a one one Goblin Berserker with haste. Defending player blocks Goblin Fire Fiend if able, uh, and it has fire breathing, so spend one red mana to give it plus one, plus oh until end of turn. I hate this card so much. <laughs> I feel like so bad. this card was in every single Ravnica pack that we ever opened back in the day while we were trying to find Glimpse the Unthinkable. <laughs> like what? it's just i it's have just, the exact same comment that i feel like i open one of these in every pack of ravnica i ever bought yes it's it every pack it's just goblin fire fiends all the way down you open it up and it's just <laughs> there's just nine goblin fire fiends in there yeah your first card is a goblin fire fiend and your last card is a foil goblin fire fiend <laughs> yes yes but even even setting that aside like what is the best case scenario for this guy you spend seven mana to trade with another four mana creature <laughs> like that, that is the best case scenario for goblin fire. And of feet. course it's, it's not even that good because it doesn't say 
you choose, it doesn't have like provoke, right? You don't choose right. which creature blocks. They block with anything. So they just throw, it's Ravnica block. They throw their 1-1. One, one. Yeah, well, and it, it's Ravnica block. And so um, Celestia is just churning out sapperlings all day long. So this gets blocked by a sapperling and dies. It's miserable. That is a great point. This, yeah, just back to back with Firefly, another card where you just go, why? Like, why was this printed? Why? Why is it? A 1-1, one, one. why does it cost four mana? Why would they put three abilities on this card? It's it's almost like, like speaking of bots, it's almost like a bot just sort of picked some quintessential red abilities <laughs> that he'd be blocked of able, one of those, that he has haste. One of those magic AI car, AI things that were trendy a couple years ago. Yeah, exactly. So it just, it it, it slaps some some red abilities on there. It, it puts some generic name. goblin-y art. Goblin name. Yeah, goblin name. Uh, and then for some reason, the bot just got the, the stats totally wrong. The, hmm. <laughs> the mana and power toughness. I wonder, like, I, I feel like I'm not a good enough balancer of cards, but I feel like if this was, say, like, rr cast, I think it would have had some kind of home. You know, it would have been like a late game, almost like a ball lightning kind of thing, like a bad ball lightning. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, for mana, it's just it's just untenable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, this card, uh, I feel like we need... Uh, I'm not sure this card is necessarily worse than, say, Firefly, but in terms of my emotions, like, I hate this card the most of any card we're going to talk about. So I feel like we need, like, an F- minus grade for Fire Fiend. It feels unfair to the other Fs. Well, uh, what if what if we give him FF for Fire Fiend? <laughs> sure. sure. Just, just double F-F. F-F. All, All right. right. FF, get out of here. Okay, let's talk about a real magic card. Goblin Settler. 3R for a 1-1 Goblin. When... Goblin Settler enters the battlefield, destroy target land. All right. So uh, if something destroys lands, I'm basically here for it. So this is already pretty good. Uh, and I think it's a little better than just being like met. It's uh, it's basically Stone Rain, staple to a body. The fact that it's a goblin means there are ways to cheat it into play. <clears throat> We're going to have one of those coming up in just two cards. There are ways to pull it out of your deck. There's tri- all kinds of tribal synergies and tribal shenanigans to take advantage of with the Goblin Settler. So I feel like as a just a cool, casual card, I really love this thing. Yeah, I I don't know. It's 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 hard for me to get super excited because it literally is what? stone rain with a goblin added to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Connor. It's but, Mons Goblin Raiders plus Stone Rain. What yeah, more do you need? It's a goblin settler. Yeah. So I mean, I th- like I think it'd be it'd be fun to to play and maybe to to have around in a cube. But yeah, I mean, it's it's two cards put together. Okay, I feel like you're a little hard on this thing. Uh, this thing is seen as somewhat. Okay, very marginal, but it has occasionally seen play in Legacy Goblin decks, which makes me very happy. Uh, and it also sees some marginal EDH play in Numot the Devastator, um, who I believe was the first commander I ever tried to build. He was a He's a land-destroying dragon from Planar Chaos. Uh, shows up in Wart Bogret Ante, um, who is a uh, goblin who reanimates goblins. So, you know, this, this thing's got some play. Yes, yeah, it's, it's got some legs. I'm not saying it can't, you know, it doesn't have any home that it can settle in. I certainly think it does, but you know, just a little, little harder to get uh, excited about than, let's say, Bomb Squad. Yeah, I hear you there. Yeah, I think it's a pity Cube Cobra's like top cards or numbers played in these cube search functionalities broken right now, because I feel like in an old border cube, this would be like right in the pocket. This would be a super fun card for an old border cube. Yeah, I agree there. So the the art, and I'm talking about the starter 1999 printing, uh, the art shows this goblin like pulling... Looks like pulling a like dead branch out of the ground in this very grim, sort of barren <laughs> wasteland with a like blood red sky. Uh, the flavor text says, "Be it ever so crumbled, there's no place like home." <laughs> oh, boo! <laughs> and boo! To me, to me, I just I I love sort of the the idea of this goblin settling by. I don't know if this is actually what the intent of this art was, but to me, it you know combined with the effect of destroying a land suggests that goblins settle by just wrecking everything and ruining the land that they're on. And that's that's their way of making it home. Yeah, it fits with like a whole theme in Magic, right? Of like goblins achieving the inverse of whatever their intent is. I, I love yeah. it. It also got a, I wish I'd known this, it got a reprint in a secret layer drop uh, with some really, really goofy cartoony art, which I love. So I wish I'd, wish I'd seen this and picked one up. That is fun. It, it looks like it's pretty affordable. It is pretty affordable. I might need one of these. Yeah, pick that up. So I'm super high on this, as you might be able to tell by my tone of voice. So I'm an I'm an S tier. I'm guessing you're not quite that high. Wow. I know. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, too I'm, rational. A, I'm at a B, you know. B, okay. I, I I feel like that's that's the right spot for me for a card that like is, you know, has has some applications, does some <laughs> basically good stuff, but isn't, you know, the most the most interesting thing I've ever seen. <sighs> Man, I, I, I'm willing to admit S is high, but I, can, what about an A, Connor? Is that too high? Is it too bland? I, I was I was about to say I feel like we uh, have not given very many A's in this episode, and then I realized the next few cards are just a C of A's. So yeah, we're re- it's funny. Um, we kind of started on the the some of the lamest cards, and then right in the middle of the alphabet here, or the middle of the list, we have I think most of the best cards. Yeah, things get good. Head into a strong string of cards here. Okay, let's go with A. All right, another another goblin card, a little bit confusingly. Goblin Snowman, 3R for a 1-1 one, one goblin. Whenever it blocks, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and dealt by it this turn. You can tap Goblin Snowman to deal one damage to target creature it's blocking. <laughs> um i really like this card the the I art is card. ridiculous it, it was originally printed in ice age um i don't know you know what the story was exactly behind uh this coming out but it's just such a like a literal take on ice age and somehow a perfect fit for goblins mm-hmm. uh in an ice age that they would just build a snowman and then i basically use it to troll other creatures I, it's it's hard for me to say whether this is like a a good or an okay card or not. Oh, I think it's pretty bad, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, I don't even care. It's not great, but there it's just it's such a such a unique card, such a like funny piece of art that that fits perfectly with these goblins peeking out from behind a snowman. One of them's like holding a snowball, another one I think is holding a hatchet, <laughs> <laughs> and like using this as a decoy. The fact that it's a, a goblin and not an ice creature, which or a snow creature, which of course didn't exist in Ice Age, uh, is just great. Yeah, I don't care if this is good. Uh, this was reprinted in Time Spiral on the Time Shifted sheet, which was um, a selection of old 121 pretty random old border cards, and they included some really good, powerful cards, although not that many of those. Uh, and then they included a lot of just weird, quirky, just totally random cards like this. Um, and just opening this for the first time and looking like, is this really, this is a real card? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, this is like a joke, you know? Yeah. And this was before like everybody knew all the funny, interesting magic cards, right? There was no EDH rack to surface these things. There was no clock spinning podcast, right? So just like opening this in a pack and going, <laughs> what is this thing? Uh, was just a, it's a great magic memory for me. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, you know, with you and I in particular, time spiral kind of coming toward the, the beginning of our, like journey and magic. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was just really fun opening up these packs and seeing these old cards that you'd never been exposed to before and, and realizing that this was one of them. Yeah. And you see like how deep magic's history is, how many like funny little corners it had, even, even with just 10 years of history, let alone today. This also appears to have gotten a secret layer drop along with mud hole, storm crow and squire, a selection of famously bad cards. And I cannot believe I missed that. And that causes me great pain. Oh man. This is just the secret layer drop pain sequence. I know here. this this one hurts more than most because this card, unlike our last card, has actually, I think because it has such a meme following, has gotten a little expensive. The secret layer drop one is $22. Although also, honestly, that art is like you, you can't compete with this. You can't compete with this original art. Mm-hmm. Uh there is this, a really, really great gatherer comment on Ooh, Goblin I'm Snowman. Excited. So this this commenter says Goblin Snowman costs four mana. Bane Slayer Angel costs five. <laughs> goblin snowman is a goblin really and so it has a tribal component tarmogoyf has not <laughs> goblin snowman prevents all combat damage vampire nighthawk doesn't goblin snowman can deal direct damage jace can't <laughs> goblin <laughs> snowman is one one ali from cairo is zero one for the same cmc hmm. so every part of goblin snowman is strictly better than that of one of the most powerful cards in magic and i haven't even talked about the artwork <laughs> i love it yeah that says it all uh, i love it uh so where do you rate this thing i have it as an s tier that's purely on the art uh, we don't normally i wouldn't normally do it on the art but to me this card like just stands alone as one of the, my favorite arts of all time yeah i i gave it an a but i think i'm gonna bump it up to to an s yes okay let's talk about i think another banger um goblin wizard 
two RR uh, for a goblin wizard, I believe. It's been errated. Uh, so this is one of those wonderful cards that has an identical type line and uh, creature uh, or name and type line. Uh, tap. Put a goblin from your hand onto the battlefield. Uh, R, target goblin gains protection from white until end of turn. All right. This is a card I was really surprised I didn't know existed. It's like a super unique, fun effect. And I'm honestly kind of amazed you don't see it uh, pop up in lists more often. Um, cheating goblins into play is fun. Uh, the protection from white is kind of weird and random, but that's kind of how old school magic cards are. It's got a fun name. It's fun that the name and the type line are identical. Oh, so why don't I see this more often? Because it's on the reserve list uh, and it's $104. Um, I, the, I've just taken you through my journey on this card, which was I felt delighted by it. And then I felt outraged that it's inaccessible to most magic players. And that, that frustrated me because it's just a fun, unique, basic card design that I wish could exist. For everybody. Yeah. It's uh it's also the second goblin wizard that we've talked about in this episode, which means that we today are covering 20% of all goblin wizards in the game. Wow. So <laughs> there's a, a lot going on in today's episode. I, I really like the art on this also. It's it's very, very old school. Um mm-hmm. the goblin here is really veiny, kind of disproportionate. He's got a gigantic head doesn't really look mm-hmm. like any of the kind of goblin archetypes that we would think of in magic today. Um, and he's kind of scary in a... He's quite scary, but also cartoony. Yeah, he's very he's very cartoony, kind of scary in a, a way that also reminds me of kind of a, a freaky children's book you might come across in a library and, and flip through as a kid and then put back because the pictures are too scary and the goblin wizard's teeth are too big. His head is weird too. His head is like the size of his torso. Right. He's got this this giant head, no neck, uh, tiny, tiny little eyes, but giant ears and teeth. Kind of a negative neck. <laughs> right. It kind of looks like his head has just been shifted down by like a centimeter in the art. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think this is just a really cool, fun uh, design. And an example of how there's actually some pretty cool cards tucked away on this list of random bad cards. Yeah, for sure. Where do you... Uh... So I rate this as an A. I, I wavered between A and S. I wanted to keep S special, and I feel like I'm kind of doling them out like candy. But honestly, I, I'm right on the bubble because I think this card is genuinely really fun. and play- One of the few cards we talked about today that genuinely I can see jamming this into a lot of decks and having it be pretty fun and even pretty decent. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like A is probably right for him. He doesn't quite make it to S for me. But, you know, it's it's a card I would want to have around if I had any goblins that I could use it with. You know, you're not getting a huge amount of value out of, like, cheating a one or two mana goblin out. But if you get a, a war chief out there off of this, that feels pretty good. Yeah, or, you know, some of the more recent expensive uh, goblins, like, uh, what is it, Muxus, the one that's kind of been mucking up various formats. Yeah, I feel like Goblin Wizard has a has a home. All right, let's give him the name. Uh, all right. A. Next up, we've got Martin Stromgald from Ice Age. Uh, let's say 2RR for a 1-1 one, one, uh, legendary human knight. Whenever he attacks, other attacking creatures get plus one, plus one until end of turn for each attacking creature other than Martin Stromgald. Whenever he blocks, other blocking creatures get plus one, plus one until end of turn for each blocking creature other than Martin Stromgald. Um, so Martin is a, uh, sort of a, a commander, not in the EDH sense, but a commander card in the, in the sense that he is enabling the rest of your creatures on the field, but not actually like participating in the battle in a meaningful way. Um, so obviously he's, he would make a red aggro deck very happy to have, um, if you have a goblin wizard and you're cheating out some goblins and getting a big board, um, having Martin lead a charge uh, would be fun. <laughs> but there's there's nothing too exciting about this for me, honestly. Yeah, I feel like for the time this was printed at, like this is a really pretty threatening effect. Um, now, obviously, Martin himself, since he doesn't boost himself, is probably going to die in the charge, but right. I feel like that's kind of okay. Like, let's say you swing in with Martin and four other creatures. Uh, those four other creatures are getting a total of plus 16, plus 16 of power and toughness, which, I mean, I, I can't think of any other card from the Sarah of Magic that has that kind of scaling, game-ending effect. That's that's a pretty big game on a four-drop. Yeah, and 
you know, you're you're right that even like he dies in the charge, but I think if you if you have this, you know, you're waiting until you have the whole board set up and knowing that he's gonna go away. But yeah, I mean plus sixteen plus sixteen or whatever you can get off of him is big stuff. Yeah, I feel like this is kind of a um you know, it's like an it's like an overrun. It's like almost better than an overrun. Effect. It's like crater. It's like crater of behemoth um, for Ice Age, which uh, which is not too bad for an Ice Age uh, four mana one one. I think uh, other aspects of this card are less strong. Like the art here, I would just say is utterly fine. Like it's not bad. It's competent. It's really not interesting. It's like just I don't know. It's just some art. It's a good guy on a horse. I I find this art just unimaginably boring it, <laughs> yeah the, the background looks like a like a, a bad imitation of a bob ross painting yeah it's like something you'd find the background's a little like something you find in a goodwill yeah <laughs> absolutely and then someone took that as the the basic piece and then someone else painted a horse like a very two-dimensional horse onto that uh and then someone else added a guy onto the horse and also some armor onto it <laughs> and it just it's it's this very very flat kind of contextless piece i guess i guess martin is in front of a mountain so you know he's red because he's in the mountains um but there's just there's nothing at all inspiring about this art or you know anything that kind of gives you a sense of who this character is or why he's a legend yeah this is uh this is a mark pool piece who's uh, actually stuck with magic all the way through the present day i believe um from alpha to today and he's got his uh his name on some really iconic cards like ali from cairo uh, ancestral recall balance birds of paradise you know and i'm just up to the bees here so he's been on uh, some really iconic incredible cards and produced some pretty fine art um but i think this one is um honestly it shows a lot of advancement because if you look at his alpha art it's fairly clumsy uh in terms of like just kind of the the rendering of it and the um like it's realistic, but not in a way that that's just disjointed. So I think this shows some technical advancement, but doesn't show like the the really fine detail of his later pieces, like uh, you know his recent City of Brass, for example, which has really good art. Um, this this thing's like kind of awkwardly in the middle. It doesn't have the funny awkward charm of Alpha art, but it also doesn't have the technical excellence of modern art. It's just like a card. Yeah, yeah, awkward is a good word for it. And the first letter of that is A, which is my rating for Martin. Yeah, I had him in an A too. I think if his art was better, he would have been actually an S for me, but uh, he doesn't quite have the whole package, unfortunately. I like his effect. I hate his art, but <laughs> almost almost like Goblin Settler. Like I, I see this effect. I see the role that it has and why you would want it and the kind of deck you would want it in, but I just can't can't get too excited about it. Oh, see, I kind of like that. I like how basic it is and yet how how it creates interesting play patterns and it makes me, both of these cards make me want to build a deck or at least put them in a deck. And uh, I don't know. I like them. All right. Let's talk about Mine Layer, a second four mana one, one dwarf from Odyssey. Four mana one, one uh, dwarf, one R tap, put a mine counter on target land. Whenever a land with a mine counter on it becomes tapped, destroy it. When Mine Layer leaves the battlefield, remove all mine counters from all lands. Okay. Um, I like this. Uh, it doesn't quite rise to the height of Goblin Settlers for me, and I'm not sure why, because it's uh, it's Baroque and funny and interesting. But uh, I don't know. There's something about it. It's like a little bit too complicated for my taste almost. Um, I don't love that you have to pay mana uh, to use the effect, uh, but I still think it's solid. It's like an ability. It can repeatedly destroy lands, kind of, if your opponent lets you. So I think it's solid, but it doesn't really get my blood uh, racing. I'm I'm really surprised by that because you love land destruction so much. I know, I know. I think it's because it doesn't literally just destroy. I don't like giving my opponent agency. You know, I don't play land destruction to give my opponent choices. You know what I mean? I know, but I I, I feel like this this kind of you know it it brings some mind games into the land destruction, right? You you yeah. put the mind counter on, and then your opponent really has to think about when they're going to blow that up and when they're going to like sacrifice that land. Yeah, that's true. I think a, a one, another problem with this, though, is the um, it comes online pretty darn late. That's true. You know, I think land destruction is best relatively early in the game. Uh, so the fact that this will destroy its first land on maybe turn five optimistically is, I think, a little too late in a lot of cases for land to really matter. Although it is fun that a single card can kind of gradually lock your opponent out of their entire mana base. Yeah, 
Right. Like think about if if your mind layer somehow sticks around for four, five turns. Uh huh, as one ones tend to do. As one ones do, and is laying all these mines, uh, you know, suddenly your opponent half of their mana base is just gonna be gone if they tap these. And in the meantime, you know, maybe they are leaving that mana off the table because they know they need that land for something else later on. I to me that's more interesting than Goblin Settler just coming in and stone raining. I mean, I kind of see that in an objective sense, but for some reason, Goblin Settler speaks to me more. There's just something hmm. about the simplicity of it um, versus this thing's kind of, I don't know. I loved the Baroque complexity of Bomb Squad, but I don't i don't like it as much here. And I honestly couldn't tell you why. I think one of the things I don't like is I find the art here very dopey. Like it's not bad, but it's just its just dopey. It's its a little weird. It's a, it's, the mine layer is in a very wide stance. <laughs> Using a very he's odd really, tool. Yeah, he's adopted a super wide stance. <laughs> he's, he's really planted himself here so he can get this mine into the ground. He's got um, a super complicated shovel. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on with that. that is tool. his shovel? It's, I think his shovel is also a war hammer. It seems to be like a collapsible war hammer with huh. not even really a shovel on the other end. It's more like a, like it looks more like a kind of it's weird. It's like a sword. Fix. It's like a giant dwarven multi tool. Right. But he's only a 1 1. One thing that does, I don't know if I could say bother me about Mind Layer, but his, his last ability, the last card text on here says when he leaves play, remove all mind counters from all lands. That obviously uh, makes him not as good. Uh, and it also really bothers me from a flavor perspective because it's like if, if the Mind Layer he dies, him all up before yeah, he does, leaves. does he like, he's, he's about to die, but he's like, hold on, hold on. Let me just, I'm just going to clean up all these mines. I'll, I'll get them off your land. You've killed me, but you know, just let me let me clean everything up for you. Maybe they find a map on his body that lists the location of all the mines. Uh, okay. Or an itinerary. Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's like his schedule of of uh, all the places he's been laying mines. The the name here is kind of awkward to me. Of like, I think the fact you've got dwarf and the word mine, like my brain kind of detours mm. subconsciously and instinctively to like Moria. Rather than landmines, like I feel like he should be called like landmine layer or like mine plant. Like there's just something in the name here kind of trips me up. Hmm. Yeah, I can. I don't know that. why I'm so hard on this guy, Connor. I know, I know. I, know. I, I thought you'd him. really like him. I thought I would too. I mean, I do like him. I actually gave him an A. We'll get to ratings in a second, but I, I don't know. I think I wanted him to be an S, and for some reason he isn't. Oh, huh. strangely, he's never been reprinted. He's six bucks or twenty five bucks in foil, uh, and this does seem like a fun thing to sneak into, like a really slow old school cube or something. It's definitely a unique, interesting effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I'm an A on this. I'm I'm also an A. He doesn't quite make it to S. He's not a bomb squad uh, for me, even though he is also a dwarf with the same mana cost, same power toughness in the same set at the same rarity. He's not a bomb squad. Do you think these were intended to be like kind of a cycle or something? Because it just seems like too much of a coincidence. There's two four mana one one dwarfs with baroque three-step abilities in odyssey i mean they they have to like there's no way that you know these aren't connected to each other in in some way like they they must have been dreamed up by the same mind Mm -hmm. yeah this feels like the mind of mark rosewater to me (laughs) it it does just just has his fingerprints all right yeah i think an a is fine i don't know why i'm a tepid a but i think he earns his a all right okay this is definitely not an a (laughs) <laughs> this is the end of the A's for a little while. Yeah, we, we had a run of really strong cards, exceptional, interesting cards, and unfortunately and, that's coming to And now this, halt. Minotaur Tactician, 3R for a 1-1 Minotaur with haste. He gets plus one, plus one as long as you control a white creature, and plus one, plus one as long as you control a blue creature. So first off, I feel like I'm sort of betraying all the other cards on this list by even looking at this mention of white and blue. And the idea that you would have anything but four mana red <laughs> one ones in in a deck of these cards, um, but what really makes me mad about this is it's even if you satisfy all these conditions of having this patriotic red white and blue set of creatures on the board, what you are left with is a four mana three three with haste, which is yeah nothing to write home about, and you are working so hard to enable this minotaur tactician. To make it to a three three, so that's that's frustrating. 
enough, especially when you consider that there's already another Minotaur that costs four mana and is a 3-3 with haste, Tower of Minotaur, who just costs two RR instead of three R. <laughs> like, literally does everything that this does when it's fully powered up, when it is fully enabled. It's just a Tower of Minotaur. All of that is bad enough, but then the art here just brings this Sorry, can we pause on yeah, that? Because you can't yeah. even make the argument that like, oh, creatures have got better because that was printed in Mirage, which is like years yes. before this card yeah, saw it print. it predates Minotaur Tactician. It's like they said, Talbra Minotaur is too strong as a four mana Minotaur. So we need to, we really need to bring the Minotaur power level down to uh, one one that may sometimes become a three three. Yeah, it's really weird to have like conditional Hill Giant. Like it just with haste, like I'm, I'm what if this was just like a 2-1? Like, I think as a 2-1, it would have made the grade as a bad common back in the day. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't have been seeing constructed play, but you wouldn't have. it wouldn't have been embarrassing in a limited context for this to come down as like a 3-2 a with haste if you had just one of the conditions turned on. But like, I don't know. This is very conditional for what you get once you put all the work in. Yeah, it's it's also kind of disappointing just as I'm reading through it again you know there's there's all this text here but nothing interesting like <laughs> i know if, there's so much text for the amount of fun you get out at the other end yeah you know maybe if you know if he got plus one plus one and life link when you control oh there you go you know, yes obviously wasn't keyboarded back then but that would be something or you know it gets It'd be pretty weird for it to get flying, but plus one, plus one, and something, as long as you control a blue creature. But it's literally just a a 1-1 one, one buff. How boring can you get? Yeah, yeah it's just so dull. Um, I The fact this was a Minotaur did make me think, maybe, I don't know if you know this guy, Connor, but there's a guy on Reddit who reviews every new set um, for the quality of its Minotaurs. I, um, I did not know that, but I'm you should look him up. very it's pretty glad great. to find out. Yeah, Magister Siren. Um, look him up. Um, so I was curious if Magister Siren had any thoughts on Minotaur Tactician since he is the Minotaur guy, but it seems even this card escaped even his notice, which tells you a lot. Um, Magister Siren, if you do have thoughts and you're listening, let us know. We'd love to we'd love to hear from you about Minotaur Tactician. Yeah, especially on the art, which I think we should turn oh, to. Oh man. Oh it's so bad. The <laughs> First off, this is a uh, Minotaur Tactician, as we've said a number of times. Uh, the Minotaur in this art has nothing to do with tactics. He is holding these two big s- sort of shapeless blades uh, as... Uh, it's it's so hard for me to describe what's going on here because it's just... It looks so He's bad. just like... Pushing, th- it's weird. So he's like a he's like a big beefy minotaur guy. He's got yeah. these shapeless blades, as you say. He's like, he's not really pushing open a door. He's just kind of walking purposefully through an opening. Yeah, I mean, it's not even. We don't even know that it's a door. Yeah, and then behind him, there's like just three blue guys, and I I guess <laughs> what what are like those they'd guys? be his friends, but. He doesn't seem worried about them. I mean, unless they're sneaking yeah. up on him, which would really be a tactical failure. I don't know. This this art is like, uh, we've had a lot of these, which I would describe as technically competent, but just bland or boring. And this one is like, it's like they knew, it's like, uh, it's like Carl Critchlow knew what card he was illustrating. He was like, I'm not going to put too much yes. effort into this one. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, it's just so, so bad. His his pose, the the, the fact that the art has nothing to do with his his name. Uh, he's just like a really dip with these like giant veiny muscles that also don't really like, aren't really symmetrical with each other. Like one arm, he's got this gigantic bicep. The other one, like his arm looks a little skinny by comparison. Yeah, you're right. It's like Carl Critchlow just said, nah, I'm, I'm not really going to put a lot into this. Yeah. Eh, good nah. enough. I and wouldn't you know either. What? For he this he was probably right. He made the right call. He did. All right. This is an easy F, right? Yep. Give it an F and move on. All right, moving on to Nalothni Dragon, um, which is an interesting card, and not just because its name is so hard to say. Nalothni Dragon is 2RR for a 1-1 creature dragon. It's got flying and banding, which I'll come back to. And it also has red. Nalothni Dragon gets plus one, plus O until end of turn. If this ability has been activated four or more times this turn, sacrifice Nalothni Dragon at the beginning of the next end step. 
Okay, so four mana, one, one, flying, banding, fire, breathing, and if you use it four more times, it dies. So it's basically Dragon Whelp um, with minus one, minus two, and banding. Okay, so this card is super unassuming to look at it. it. You just look at it initially and you think, okay, it's one of these weirdly complicated yet not good old school magic cards. Who cares? Incidentally, it has somewhat confusing art because the most prominent thing in this art is this monkey man, not the dragon, which is just weird. But then there's a little clue to what's interesting about this card if I read you the flavor text. These small but intelligent dragons and their Olesian allies held back the tide of Pashalik Monza's horde of goblin raiders. Okay, so far so standard, but then we have the words in the flavor text. Dragon Con 1994. Now, what is that about? Um, so what that's about is this is the first promo card in the history of Magic. So Magic was popping off in 1994. Um, the game was exploding in popularity very, very rapidly. Uh, and so Wizards decided to uh, print a special promo card for an old con called Dragon Con. And the first 10,000 people to visit their booth at Dragon Con would get a postcard that they could mail in for a copy of this uh, lame card. Um People who weren't at the con had no way to get a copy. And this really made people mad. I think not so much because the card itself was good, but because of the precedent that this could set about promo cards with no normal retail availability. And if Wizards just happened to print a good one, the consequences could be pretty dire. Uh, and so there's a mini firestorm of controversy. Watsi eventually relented and included a free copy in uh, Duelist magazine, which was uh, the magazine they used to publish about magic. Uh, so Duelist issue number three included a free copy. Uh, and Watsi was also pretty chastened and they actually stopped printing mechanically unique promo cards for quite a while. Um, with the exception of Mana Crypt, which uh, weirdly made its um, debut as a mail-in promo if you bought Magic the Gathering novels, uh, Watsi stayed entirely clear of mechanically unique promo cards all the way until Firesong and Sunspeaker. And I would argue really until those stupid Walking Dead promos uh, from a couple of years ago. Those in turn caused uh, the exact same Firestorm of Controversy, which Wizards backed off again from. Um, so, you know, some things just don't change. Uh, if for some reason this you want even more detail than I just shared about this uh, extremely complicated story, I'll link a Card Kingdom blog post in the show notes that goes into a more detailed version of the story. Wow. There is a lot to unpack with this card. <laughs> I know. And we haven't even talked about banding. That's Oh, my goodness. Should we even talk about banding or should we just say, if you don't understand what banding is, like we're, we're not going to tell you. It's too I, hard to explain. That, I mean, I kind of lead toward the second one. If you ask me to explain banding right now, I don't think I could. Okay. Uh, banding, I will just say, if you're not familiar with it somehow, uh, is one of the most famously complicated keyword abilities in Magic. Maybe the most complicated. One other thing that I enjoy about this card uh, is that it is the only red card with banding, which is a you know interesting little selling point. Hmm. You know, now that now that you mentioned banding, not that we're not that we should get into more detail on this, but there was a one commenter on on Gatherer for Martin Stromgall just to jump back a few cards. Uh, okay. <clears throat> actually, said I'd feel more comfortable with this card if it had banding, and oh. I I just thought that must be the first time. <laughs> anyone has ever said that about any card boy i think if martin stromgald had banding he would have actually been pretty oppressive again not to go into banding but banding is a very complicated keyword that uh the general consensus says is much much stronger than it looks so i think uh it's probably for the best martin didn't have banding i think he would have been pretty obnoxious i think that's right uh so where do, where do you rate nalothni dragon connor i mean just just on the the card itself not not taking the you know, fascinating background into, you know, into consideration. He's pretty much an F for me. I mean, this is a, <laughs> yes, this is Firefly, right? Uh, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think this is an easy F for me. I, it's just, su it's just super lame. And actually, you know what? The weird backstory makes it deserve an F because it was wizards trying to pull a fast one, you know? Hmm. Very good point. F for fast one. Yeah, I don't think we should let wizards get away with that. I think I this think needs you're to right. Be an, this this ultimately this show is about accountability. That's that's right. <laughs> accountability <laughs> and integrity are our clock spinning core values. Yes, I think this is an F. All right, all right. Next up, we've got Quorum Trench Gnomes. Three R for a one one gnome. Uh, who can tap? I got. I got to pull up the oracle text here. <laughs> this, <laughs> Although I do think you're going to have to read the printed text too. Well, I that. yeah, I need to read both. Yeah, I need to read both. I've 
but I think I need to start with the Oracle text uh, to really have the original printing um, get get full effect here. So the Oracle text says, tap. If target planes is tapped for mana, it produces colorless mana instead of white mana. This effect lasts indefinitely. Now the card itself, the actual printing says, tap. Target planes produces one colorless mana instead of white until end of game. Use counters. <laughs> So I, I can't give these gnomes a complete F rating in good faith just because of those two words, use counters. There's just something so wonderfully passive aggressive about, about the way this is used here. It's not really clear from that text whether you have to use the counters or if this is just sort of a suggestion that you should use counters because you're going to forget. The Oracle text obviously shows that it's uh, the latter, that it's just a suggestion. Uh, but I just love those two words here. Use counters. Uh, me too. I think the rest of this card is like, there's not too much to say about it, but I agree. There's just something really wonderful about the just the flatness of it. That just kind of like, yeah, use counters. And it's it's really hard to say um, what the intent was there, whether it's mandatory or not. It's just it's just funny, right? And you know, it's 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 not like counters were uh, a new concept when this was printed in Legends, right? The counters have been around since Alpha. Uh, right. And I was just trying to figure out, I think the alpha ones also had a kind of, um, I think the alpha ones might have also just said, like, use counters. Um, let me go try to find that. Um, why don't you talk about the art while I try to figure out what alpha said? For All right. Counters? Yeah. The, the art is a whole separate story here. Um, it, it's It's kind of so comically bad that it's hard to know where to start with it. First off, it's it's completely unapologetically... 2D. The gnomes, of which there is only one uh, in the art, despite this card being called Quorum Trench Gnomes, plural. Uh, the one gnome that's shown here uh, apparently has only one leg and one arm, because you can only see one of each. Uh, he's he's leaning forward at like a like 60 degree angle into this sort of Da Vinci-esque drill machine uh, that's just drilling in a completely 2d way through some uh poorly drawn dirt uh he has he has some sort of cylinder backpack thing that i guess is gathering up all the dirt that he's drilling or trenching through uh and that backpack is mounted to his back and also kind of his butt mm, yeah and he's leaning forward in a way that's got to be bad for his back yeah, i think it's really bad for his back uh and then the backpack also has this hose coming out of the bottom of it that I guess goes behind his one leg or between his two legs and uh, is scooping up all that dirt for reasons that are unclear from this card. Yeah, this feels like a card that was just kind of a little too technically demanding in like a anatomy sense for Dan Frazier back then. Of course, Dan Frazier has you know, gone on to do many wonderful things. This is the kind of card I feel like I should have a soft spot for because it messes with lands and it has goofy art, but I don't know why this goofy art just doesn't sing to me in the way Goblin Snowman does. I think it's because Goblin Snowman is still well executed. It's just humorous. Whereas this is just really awkward. There's not really much emotion in this guy, uh, picture either. Like his face is utterly blank. There's literally no emotion visible on his face. It just doesn't make much sense when you look at it. It's just not a, it's just not a, I don't know. It's just not an enjoyable piece of art for me. It's not fun to look at. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's kind of nothing. It's, it's very, the color palette is also really, really bland. It's like almost entirely brown. Um, <laughs> there's just nothing to really enjoy about it other than just the fact that it's like so strange and bad. I'm back with a use counters report. So I don't think any of the other alpha cards just say use counters. They all kind of refer, interestingly, they refer to counters in a really natural way. Like, um, you know, gets a plus one, plus one counter, this really basic natural language like today. Um, there is a slight parallel in the hive from alpha says originally five creates one giant wasp, a one, one flying creature represent wasps with tokens, making sure to indicate when each wasp is tapped. I'm going to keep reading because it has wonderful text. Wasps can't attack during the turn created. Treat wasps like artifact creatures in every way, except that they are removed from the game entirely if they ever leave play. If the hive is destroyed, the wasps must still be killed individually. Oh, I love that. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. But it does kind of it does a decent job explaining all of tokens, which of course were a brand new idea uh, in a few sentences. Yeah. Anyway, the trench gnomes. I have them as an F, and I think that's just out of peak or malice. I, I can happily go up a little bit, but I, not too far. Please. Yeah. So, I mean, as I said, I the only reason I won't give this an F is use counters. <laughs> um, so for me, it's a D. D. Uh, I don't know. If, I think use counters for me is good for one tier up, not two. I think this is an E. Hmm. <sighs> I don't know. I want I want to stick with the it's got the use counters. It's got this awful art that at least has gotten us talking about it. And it has what I think has to be a unique effect. All right. All right. You're right. It's a D. It's a D. This can't be can't be that low. Sticking up for you, gnomes. Should this go all the way to like a C just because it's so weird? No, no. I feel okay. like C. All right. I got excited. You were carried along by the momentum no. of your points. C is the rating for a boring, mediocre card like fallen ferromancer all right let's talk about rabble rouser 3r for a 1-1 goblin shaman bloodthirst one which means if an opponent was dealt damage this turn this creature comes into play with a plus one plus one counter on it r tap attacking creatures get plus x plus o until end of turn where x is rabble rouser's power this is one of those cards that's just kind of flat and boring like it feels like this has been around for 16 years. It's had plenty of time to make an impression on me or other magic players. Uh, and it just hasn't. It's just like, it's not a totally embarrassing card. I'm sure this appeared in some draft decks. I'm sure it even won some games. It's not bad. It's not great. It's just a card. And I don't really have anything to say about it. Yeah, it is just a card. It is from a set, Guild Pact, that introduced the Bloodthirst keyword. And back when that keyword was introduced, I was very determined to build and run a Gruel deck, which was the you know red green guild in Ravnica that had the Bloodthirst keyword associated with it. Um, and I feel like there's this card kind of has a little lesson in it that you know just because uh, a shiny <laughs> new keyword appears on a card uh, and that card sort of theoretically fits into the into what this archetype is trying to do. Uh, that does not mean that the card is good or interesting <laughs> or fun to have in a deck. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So let's get this guy out of here. What's What rating do you have for him? I have it as an E. I mean, I feel like I couldn't go all the way to F because it at least is like semi-playable and probably did a thing, but I, I could only go one. I could only muster the energy to go one level above F. Yeah, I think, I think E's right. I don't think I gave out any any ease in this episode it's a very confusing rating we actually debated not excluding it yeah so I, I gave him a d but i think you're right about e all right e it is e for extraneous mm -hmm. okay next card is scampering scorcher 3r for a 1-1 elemental uh when scampering scorcher enters the battlefield create two 1-1 red elemental creature tokens elementals you control gain haste until end of turn so Scampering Scorcher basically creates a couple of copies of itself and then gives all of those copies and any other ele elementals you have haste. So I I I really like that these these little scorchers who are very cute, I think. They're so cute. Um they've sort of cheated their way onto this list by breaking up their true nature of being a 3-3 <laughs> three, three into three one ones. Uh so I feel like they're not really competing with you know they're 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 sort of in a different league from all these other one ones by cheating on their stats like that. Um, but I like this card a lot. It's it's a cute little effect. I like that it's you know it's not just creating three one ones and giving them haste, but it gives you this extra upside for having other elementals. It's like a a fun effect that like rewards that tribal play, but not in a in a crazy way. Just fun little card. Yeah, it, I, I would class this along with like Goblin Settler and Martin Stromgald. It's just really kind of classic or really simple designs that lead to interesting emergent gameplay. This one in particular, like on the face of it, this is basically a, a hill giant with haste, which as we established is like not amazing, but it's okay on rate. But of course, as soon as you start getting any kind of effects that reward you for going wide, this goes from like, okay to like really good you know you have like an anthem effect and now you're getting six six hasty attackers on your four mana creature which is you know obviously really good um this i believe uh it's possible there's some old obscure card that i don't know about here that 
managed to see standard play, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think this is the only card in this list that actually saw competitive standard play. Um, back when M20 was new, uh, there was an elementals deck, uh, like a teamer elementals tribal deck that was running around arena a lot and was a true blast to play. Uh, and this showed up in some versions, I think largely because it could trigger Risen Reef um, three times. Risen Reef, for anyone who's not familiar with it, um, is a uh, elemental kind of a lord. Uh, so it's one GU for a 1-1. One, one, and it says whenever it or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, um, basically you explore. So you look at the top card. If it's a land, put it into play tapped. If you don't, put it into your hand. So Scampering Scorcher was pretty nuts with Risen Reef as a way to basically draw three cards and or ramp up to three lands. So uh, it's got a, I've got a soft spot for it in my heart because I played a ton of that deck when it was in standard. Nice. He's, uh, he also has, I think, quite a bit of synergy with Martin Stromgald, like oh as my gosh, just these right. two cards together, you know, like they're, they're sort of in a similar design space and I think also would go very well together. You know, you get your Scorchers out and then swing with your Martin and let's see what, how much damage would that be? be 12, 12 right from the scorcher because they all get plus three plus three yeah yeah i think so wow. so one card you're bringing 12 power with martin <laughs> wow i love that little synergy built into our spreadsheet here That's yeah amazing. this this four mana red one one deck is coming together that's right yeah these are these are definitely the staple i don't know what else is going in the deck but those, those two together actually genuinely seem good yeah uh so where do you rate this so i give it i give it an a it's it's a fun effect. I think it's like a, a decent card. And as you said, like one of the few cards in here that actually has had any kind of standard impact that we know of. Uh, and the, the art of these little Scorchers is just cute. Yeah, I gave it a B, but that feels harsh. I think I'm right there with you on A. It's not quite an S tier because it just doesn't have that um, sex appeal that gets you to S tier, but it's a, it's a really solid, interesting design. And also... Um, I think this is one of the few cards in this list that I can totally see putting into like just a low powered cube. I think this could do some fun, interesting things in a lot of environments. Yeah. Hey, it is. Hey. All right. Seismic Mage. 3R for a 1 1 human spell shaper. 2R tap. Discard a card from your hand. Destroy target land. So this is a, a spell shaper, as we used to call him, which is to say a creature. Um, that discards a card from your hand to basically turn a card from your hand into a spell uh, that stone rains. Uh, I, I feel like I keep apologizing for not loving land destruction creatures enough because I do love land destruction. <laughs> but again, this guy is so unlovable. Um, I think the uh, the effect here is it's okay. It's pretty expensive. Kind of like the problem we had I had with uh, the mine layer. I think often this is going to come online a little too late to do what you need it to do. But let's be honest, the real problem here is just this art is super goofy and just just dumb. It's it's so bad. It's Pete Pete Venner's I think has failed us in this episode. He he brought us the <laughs> um the uh, goblin ember mage, was it? Uh yeah, I think so. Or ember I feel mage very goblin. harsh on uh Pete Venner's this episode, but you're right. He has had some stinkers. Yeah, this this if if ember mage goblin was bad, seismic mage is just on another level here. Yeah, you want to explain why? Uh, yeah, I'll do my Try best. Try to look at the art while we talk about this because it, it is hard to convey. Yeah, you how, you uh, got to pull this guy up. To land really, inspired it is. you know, live live through this moment with us. So first off, the background is literally just one solid color. I'm not I'm not talking about like a, a wash here or sort of a nice gradient of, you know, shades of a color. Like literally, it is just one mustard yellow color, all the way through. Second off. The angle on this is pretty unconscionable to me. <laughs> we're getting we're getting basically an upskirt of this seismic mage, uh, and really, I mean, but maybe maybe we're learning something about Pete Venner's through hmm. this set review. Hmm. But you know, first we had the Ember Mage Goblin with the little hmm. issue, um, yeah. and now we have Seismic Mage, where we're we're really getting. The, the nether regions just highlighted <laughs> in a very, you know, very particular, very exact, almost the exact center of the art. Yep. Right. Right in the middle of the art. Uh, you've got these highlights and shadows that really emphasize what you're looking at and, yep. and draw the eye to that center of the art. So the angle is is a problem. But the worst part of this art for me is that this seismic mage is straddling the giant crack in the ground that he apparently is making. Yeah. Why is he why is why does he have 
his feet on either side of a this gigantic crack with some sort of hellfire coming out of it. It doesn't look very sustainable, does it? It looks it about like two seconds away from disaster. Right. Like something this is not gonna end well for the seismic mage, who I I, I don't know if he just didn't think through this spell before he started casting it. Uh, if he like targeted the wrong land, the wrong ground, and accidentally got the one under his feet. But he looks very happy about it. He's got this this evil grin on his face, which I also don't like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that is somewhat interesting about this card is you'd think there would be more kind of tap, destroy a land uh, creatures in Magic, but there's really not. So this is, um, I'll link a Scryfall search that sort of gets at this, but um, almost all the other creatures that tap to destroy lands either require you to sack a permanent as a cost or they can only target non-basic lands. Hmm. Uh, so this is the only red card that can just tap to destroy a land, interestingly. Uh, the other three are all black. Demonic Hordes, Helldozer, and Minion of Leshrac. Uh, so I thought that was marginally interesting, that um, this is the only kind of stone rain on a stick effect in red that um, doesn't require like destroying or have targeting restrictions or require sacking something. Wow. That's really surprising. Yeah. Um, that said, I, I still don't like this card. No, not at all. One last thing I want to mention that I don't like about Seismic Mage is his flavor text. Uh, it says, the ground shakes when he walks. His customers shake if they're late with his fee. Who are the customers of Seismic Mage? <laughs> who, who, is, <laughs> who is paying this guy to go destroy lands or to, to create cracks under his own feet? What, and your local strip mall doesn't have a, a seismic mage? I, if if they do, they keep it very quiet. And the, the, the earthquakes must be very, very small because I, I don't feel them. But who who are this this guy's customers? And why are they so afraid of him when he's a 1-1 one, one who apparently like just drops himself into the crevice that he creates? Yeah, actually, a lot of these other tap destroy land creatures kill themselves in the process. I kind of feel like Seismic Mage should kill himself based on the uh, art here. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to last long being a 1-1. One, one. Yeah. All right. Uh, I rated this as a D just because it at least kills a land. But I don't know. I can be persuaded down. He's, he's an F for me. Oh, I can't I just, go all the way for, to F for Stone Rain on a with, stick. With this art, I just... Uh, I, I I can't I just I I don't want to let this card have anything more than that. I don't know. I think that's that's too harsh. I just I I'm normally willing to go to F, but I I feel like this is better than an F. It's an E. Just just on on power level alone, just stone rain on a stick. Just stone rain on a stick. That's all I ask. All right. Okay. We can do E. All right. Thanks. All right. E it is. All right. Our final card today, Whipkeeper. 2RR for a 1-1 one, one dwarf. Tap, Whipkeeper deals damage to target creature equal to the damage already dealt to it this turn. Uh, this is another 4-mana 1-1 one, one dwarf from Odyssey, the third one uh, in today's episode, and easily the worst. Mm. Just a To me, this is the, the perfect example of a card that could have cost less, could have been bigger, could probably have been both, and instead of that, we got a, a card with a, a somewhat interesting effect not necessarily a, a great one or a strong one but at least a little bit interesting that ends up being totally useless because it's a four mana one one i totally agree and i would add that i really don't like the art here i feel like from odyssey through uh onslaught block wasi was really pushing hard on like bulgy 90s comics kind of grossness especially on male characters they're all like just super bulgy and high contrast and unpleasant and uh this card is to me just super super unpleasant to look at i'd almost take seismic mage over this guy that's how much i dislike this guy's intense bulgingness i mean if, if you've got a problem with intense bulgingness then seismic mage <laughs> is not the right card to compare to <laughs> all right you got me on that one i still really don't like the art i mean you're not going to defend this art oh no 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 i think Ron Spencer, who did this one, and many, many of the the bulgingest boys of this era, this, this you you look at this and you immediately know that it's Ron Spencer, and I don't necessarily mean that as a compliment. Yeah, I'm sure there are plenty of Ron Spencer super fans out there, but it just doesn't do it for me. He was kind of to his credit, he was bulging before it was cool. You know, you go all the way back to like his alpha art on like Bog Imp, and there's already a little bit of contrasty bulge, and he kept going. 
long past the time others had stopped. Like I'm looking at some Lorwyn block art on like Burrington Bombardier and Boone Reflection and those bulge too. So at least at least he stuck by it. You know, he didn't he didn't back down. You know, he he knows what he likes and you gotta respect it. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, uh yeah, I don't have too much to say about this card. I this did make me crunch the numbers. I was like three out of twenty-four of these cards are dwarves, which seem like overrepresentation because there's not that many dwarves in magic. So bear with me. 12.5% of all of our four mana one ones in red are dwarves. By contrast, just 2.3% of all red creatures in magic are dwarves. So they are definitely way overrepresented in the four mana one one camp, um, which I would have assumed meant that uh, dwarves take the crown as the, the lamest... Um, <laughs> Red creature tribe, at least as mm-hmm. measured by mm-hmm. four mana one ones. But astonishingly, goblins managed to do, be even more overrepresented. So there are 337 goblins in magic, which is 16% of all red creatures. Um, but 42% of the cards we talked about today are goblins. So goblins and dwarves are really depressingly overrepresented in this uh, in this list. Wow. Together, that, that makes them over half of the cards in today's episode. Huh. I guess they're both diminutive tribes. Yeah. I, physically. F- for me, f- four mana one one seems right somehow on a goblin. For a dwarf, it, it makes me a little sad. Because they're they're meant to be buff little fellas? Yeah, you know, they're sort of stronger warrior types, right? Yeah, I mean, this guy certainly put on plenty of muscle. I think he'd be disappointed to be stat lined as a one one. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to tell him. Uh, I have this as an F because uh, it's just... I mean, honestly, just to punish it for being the last card in the episode. If it was earlier, I might give it a fair shake, but it's just an F. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, most of the uh, episodes we've had of clock spinning so far tend to end on a uh, F tier card or the impav equivalent. So F feels right. Yeah, why? I don't know why that should be. All right. Well, before we go to the uh, outro, I feel like we should quickly uh, read back um, our ratings. So we had one FF card, Connor. Goblin Fire Fiend. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, a collection of F cards. So we had Aki Underminer, Firefly, Minotaur Tactician, Nalothny Dragon, and Whip Keeper at F. In E, we had Rabble Rouser and Seismic Mage. In D, this is a competitive category, we had Aladdin, Ben Ben Aki Hermit, Cinder Seer, Ember Mage, and Quorum Trench Gnomes. Pretty crowded at D. I know. It feels right, doesn't it? <laughs> at the uh, C tier, we had Aki Lava Runner and Fallen Feralmancer. Strangely, just uh, two Cs and actually just one B in Amplifier. Then we were surprisingly generous with our A's and S's. So for A's, we had uh, Diaochan, Goblin Settler, Goblin Wizard, Martin the Stromgald, and Mine Layer, and Scampering Scorcher. And then finally, our coveted S's, just to Bomb Squad and Goblin Snowman. The top of the top. The top of the top. Go out and buy your copies today before they explode. Well, Connor, this unexpectedly long episode has left me dangerously close to late on my seismic mage fees. So I'm going to go whip keeper my finances into shape. Um, (laughs) Meanwhile, listeners, I hope you all have enjoyed the artful beauty of our four mana one ones. Uh, If you have feedback, thoughts, or memories to share about any of the cards or topics today, it seems unlikely, but perhaps some of you have played with some of these cards. (laughs) You can always email us at clockspinningpodcast at gmail.com or uh, better yet, just comment on Reddit. Uh, We're also curious for your feedback and thoughts on this episode. We tried something a little bit different today. So, you know, let us know what you thought. Is this the kind of thing you'd like to see more of? Or should we stick to our kind of A game of just linearly proceeding through really uh, old sets of lots of cards? Next episode, we'll be uh, doing a final wrap up on Champions of Kamigawa, sharing the results of some playtesting and talking about where we're going next. Until then, though, I'm Austin. And I'm Connor. Thanks for listening. 